Hello, everybody. Ron Callis here with another episode of Automation Unplugged. We are here for episode number 87. And uh, let me go ahead and jump over real quick to Facebook just to see if we are streaming live. So bear with me here. Let me refresh my Facebook feed. All right, come on, baby. Let's see how this is going. All right, and we are live. Okay, this looks good. All right, so we're here for episode number 87. Uh, I'm going to be interviewing Justin Johnston from Twilight Solutions. Uh, you probably noticed my environment is a little bit uh, different than normal. I'm actually coming to you from a fine uh, residence in here in Weston, Florida. Uh, moved out of my house, uh, 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 purchased a new house, waiting to move into that. And our lovely builder has uh, changed the move in or the closing date on us. So uh, I'm, I'm homeless here for a few weeks and uh, I'm going to be coming to you from uh, the residence in in Weston, Florida until I move into my new place. But uh, that does not stop us from uh, filming and recording our Automation Unplugged shows. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right in to that. So stand by here. Let me bring in Justin. There he is. What's up, Mr. Justin? Hello, sir. How are you? I am. I'm good. I'm. I'm. You know what? We made it out pretty well. There was a. <clears throat> I don't know if you recall. There was a hurricane here off the coast of Florida the last. I don't know. Seems like the last week or so. Uh, but it it has finally just decided to move on and head up the coast and bother some other people and and le leave us alone here in South Florida. I'm well aware. I was in Montreal over the weekend and on my way home, my flight was canceled. So I had to, or was offered to stay at uh, good old Mark Fisher's house in Philadelphia for the night. That's where I was last night. Just got back to the Bay Area this morning. Oh my God. Now there was a, a, a were you up there for the wedding? Yes. Greg Simmons finally called it uh, done with the single life and married uh, Laurel. And uh, that was an awesome evening. And there's, about 80 people in Montreal on the rooftop having a great time. Mark Fisher was DJing. He managed to get the cops called on us. Um, how that happens on a rooftop bar on a holiday weekend and a Sunday night while there's a festival down in the, in the city is beyond me, but I'd say it was a good time. Now, I did see Greg on Facebook with handcuffs. Was that as a result of getting the phone call or was that a uh, part of the, the act prior? That was prior. They thought they'd be funny with some pictures, but they probably drew more attention to themselves because they ended up showing up seven hours later to shut us down. So <laughs> I don't know if it worked out so well. <laughs> Got it. And uh, uh, we have, Justin, a bunch of people jumping in to say hi. So let's, let's actually put some of this up on the screen here. We have uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry Efron has uh, jumped in to say hi. And Hello. hey, Jerry, how are you? And uh, let's see here. Who do we have? We have Thomas. Salute us. Thomas, remind me, where are you coming to us from? If I, if I recall, you're, you're coming to us from somewhere down south. Uh, I want to say maybe Panama or Colombia. But uh, if I got that wrong, I apologize. Just jump in. Tell me where you're coming to us from. And uh, we have Chris. Chris Gamble is coming to us. He's coming to I know Chris is coming to us from the U.K., and uh, he says, glad the hurricane missed us. Hey, you and me both. Although uh, my heart and feelings go out for the people of Bahamas, uh, my goodness, that country is going to be in need of some help uh, for sure. They were, uh, you know, I, I can't even fathom having a Category 5, 4 or 5 storm hit you briefly. But they had it sit over top of them for the better part of a couple of days blowing at, you know, 150 miles an hour plus gusts at one point were up to 185. I mean, just total devastation. Um, sad stuff for sure. Man, all sorts of people. Justin, you are Ron's hero, apparently. <laughs> there you go. 
Hey, Ron. <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, Thomas jumped in. He said he's coming to us from Panama. And uh, Rich uh, Fregesso, he says he was uh, grabbing a cup of coffee and happy to see broadcasting, Ron. Always good to see quality integrators from the San Francisco Bay Area getting exposure. Hey, get I appreciate away. that. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, look at that. We got Chris. All right, man. We got a lot. You got a lot of fans out there, Justin. You got all sorts of people jumping in saying hello. Mm -hmm. Nice little flex. All right. (laughs) Yeah, a little flex. All right. So, Justin, I, uh, you, and I have known each other a long time, but uh, uh, some of our guests or those listening may not know you and kind of uh, uh, where you come from, you know, and how you landed in this industry. So do you mind giving us a little bit of the the backstory and then we'll jump in? I have a whole list of fun topics to go over with you. Absolutely. Um, I became interested in electronics and had a knack for stuff at a young age, you know, doing remote control cars and boats like a lot of us did. And as I grew older, I've gotten interested in car audio, which I know a lot of us did as well. And so I, when I first turned 18, I went to the local Circuit City Road Shop and uh, got a job there. Worked there for about a year and a half. And during that time, you know, really saw a lacking for service, like any big box retailer. They did it probably the best they could at that time. Um, so I started doing things, you know, outside on the weekends and whatnot. I was a full-time college student as well. And so I, I worked with pretty much full-time at Circuit City, the road shop, full-time college student, and went to a private school that I was putting myself through for the most part with some scholarships and realized that uh, my, you know, whatever hourly wage was not going to fit the bill. So I started Twilight uh, Solutions, and the name comes from the fact that the only hours left to work were in the twilight. So I, you know, work my 40 hours at this road shop and go to school full-time and was commuting about 3,000 miles a month back then. It was not a fun time. So I started Twilight, and after about two years of doing all that at the same time, I was able to let go of the hourly job, build Twilight, and uh, became the youngest contractor in the state at, at about 22 and just kept building it. And that's when things started getting added to the category like automation and things like that. So it just evolved since then, and it's been a definitely a, a, a road and a windy one, but it's fun, and I love the industry, and the people, friends I've made have been pretty awesome, so I don't regret it at all. Uh, when you and I were, were getting ready to go live, you had mentioned to me that you've, you're, you're maybe one of the few, you're certainly one of the few, uh, maybe the only one that I know. So that it probably makes you one of the few that are a 20 year veteran of the industry and you're, you're under the age of 40. That's true. I mean, I remember when I was first going to the CDS shows and the CES shows, um, at, as a teenager in my early twenties, you know, you would be looked at as just like a technician, installer, or whatever. So, um, but then when I tell people I'm the owner, they still wouldn't believe it. So, even my clients, I remember putting on my business cards until I was about my late 20s. It just said, uh, like, it just said project manager. It didn't say owner, founder, principal, none of that because people just didn't take it seriously. So now it's it's cool because now I'm getting into a, a time period where you know people assume that I'm the owner and it's great. But I've also got a lot of experience behind me, and and it's uh, a nice little you know, thing to have up my sleeve, but yeah, it's kind of cool. Before you know it, you'll start getting some of this gray hair. Yeah. You know? Right. It's Unless you, you use hair club, for, hair club for men or beard club for men and just keep, uh, you know, dying it dark. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not, not yet, but I'm sure it's on its way at some point. <laughs> that's, that's funny. And, uh, we have Chris, he just posted, he said, uh, who's Justin? I don't know him. And then uh, he goes, uh, clearly <laughs> a hustler. great early day grind. Oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's that's funny. Oh yeah, and then we have Vanessa. She just jumped in. She says, "Hey, Justin's greeting from Davie, Florida." Hello, hello, and uh, maybe you know this person, Matthew Rodriguez says, oh, "Word." Boy. Yeah, he's out at a job site, just hanging out, watching TV. I guess today. Just kidding, Matt. I know you're busted. clearly <laughs> nothing. Not, Matt's got nothing better to do than than watch. <laughs> Old Justin, yes, got to get interview action. We've, we've been together, Matt and I, for over twenty years now. So he's he's an OG for our team. Wow, is he a project manager, installer? What does he? What does Matt do? He's our 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 get everything done, whatever you need kind of guy. And I've known Matt since uh, I was eighteen. We used to work at Circuit City together back in the day, and he's definitely a superstar. We're blessed to have him, and um, 
nobody watching this try and take him from us because he's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to throw up one more comment here. Chris says, uh, now we have a huge wave of under 25-year-old smart home biz owners in the UK. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's interesting. Actually, I just interviewed Chris a few weeks ago. We were talking about all the crazy action happening over there in the UK. All right. So, uh, Justin, I, I want to jump into a few topics with you here. And I know time is limited both for, for you and for our audience. Um, so the first one, and you are particularly close to home to this topic, and that is, you know, what just broke in the news, of course, was that Bravis, you know, they finally did the deal after, you know, four or five years of, of people talking about it and, and it being out there. Uh, Steve and Paul, and of course, all the owners uh, were, uh, their reverse merger, was completed and there was an investment stake from an outside entity that came in. Uh, $75 million was the published number. And you, I, I know that you uh, in, in particular were actually working with Steve first for many years before Bravis became a thing. And so I, I'm curious just on your read of the whole situation. Well, I think it's absolutely awesome. And congrats, hats off to the guys and the ladies that were part of that. Um, it's pretty, pretty amazing feat. I've been, I've known Steve for at least, at least 10, 12 years and really have believed in a lot of things that he has done and said and has set up and uh, very grateful because, you know, I, I don't have a business background and he was a, a mentor and he still is to this day, him and Paul are great guys. Um, so it's awesome what they've done. And uh, I, I believe in the process and the systems um, for, you know, since day one. And I'm really happy and excited to see where they're going to go with it going forward. And, you know, I really hope that the Twilight team is and is going to become a part of the Bravas team uh, over the next however many, uh, you know, how long that takes to get done. I think it's really cool. It's very exciting for our industry. They've set a standard now that otherwise has not been set or even explored. Um, and it's really cool to see that. And the fact that we're, that they've received some, some pretty substantial funding from a reputable company out of, out of the Bay Area, actually, that's uh, pretty awesome. So I think that the future is bright for integrators and that they've created that light that otherwise was not in existence prior to uh, this announcement. So it's pretty awesome. Now, the, the million dollar question for you in particular is you were involved with Bravis very early. I, I want to say, and, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe around 2015, uh, 16 and, and maybe beyond that. And then you, you exited that, that partnership or that relationship in, in some way. And now you're, you're actually looking at, you're particularly interested in re-engaging with them. Can you, you know, fill uh, the audience in on kind of how that transition happened? And I know you had a lot of other things going on in your life personally and professionally, and that was the reason, but. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've worked with Steve for many years. And in fact, when before Bravis, it was called Vital Management. And before that, it was Fast Forward Business Coaching. So that's when we started working together was Fast Forward Business Coaching, which I met Steve while he did a presentation for Jeremy Burkhart at a Speedercraft event, probably circa five or so. And just thought he was a great guy and had the tools on the back end to keep some of these companies functioning. And so we got involved and he, he told me about Bravis. I loved it. And we were a part of it for probably a year and a half, two years. But that same time, I have another company with my brother uh, called Wallet Buckle, where we created a product. It's a patented product. Uh, we're featured on Shark Tank. And so at that time, you know, it was hard to do head up the Bravis because you figure having your integration company is, is one thing, but then doing it in, in a Bravis method is almost like starting a new company for a lot of people. And that's you know why it works and why it took so long. There's a lot of things you have to do and do right. And so for me, I had just hit the road on a, basically a national tour promoting my other company. And that required a lot of time away from physically being in the Bay area. So for about two, two and a half years, I was literally in an RV all over the country in 30 plus States, 70,000 miles, coast to coast, back and forth. Every weekend was a new show. So it really took my, my eye off the ball for the Bravis opportunity, which, you know, I'm glad this has happened. And it's great that it did because now there's a, a structure in which it, it needs to work for it to become something that an outsider investing in can believe in. And now that that's there, I'm fully committed and 100% want to be back as a part of that team. I know a lot of those people very well. 
and I've been talking to him, um, you know, as much as I can. And we got Cedia coming up next week, so I'm sure I'll see a lot of them. And uh, we'll go from there and see if we can't be a good fit because I know that the San Francisco market is definitely a very big one and would do uh, a lot of justice, I believe, to the group as a whole. Now, and, and what do you say to any of the skeptics out there? You know, when anything big and, and ambitious happens, there's always the haters that want to hate. Uh, and and maybe there's no stop in the haters. But what what are what are your thoughts for those folks? You know, I'm a big believer in positive energy. You know, sp- spreading just good thoughts and and being uh, helpful and and just doing kind. And that's it. And you know, I don't know anybody that's a hater that's got a seventy five million dollar anything. So <laughs> it's like let them do their thing. And if you're not going to be uh, the spread and love and being positive, then just maybe keep your mouth shut, you know? <laughs> uh, a- amen to that. Amen yeah. to that. Now, uh, let's talk. We do got CD around the corner. It's next week, in fact. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you there, of course. Um, let's talk uh, technology, if you don't mind. And I, I want to kind of rapid fire through some different topics and kind of get your two cents on those topics. What What trends are you seeing there in the Bay Area? and or for the industry at large. Does that sound like a, a plan? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, I want to start with tunable lighting. I know you're in particular a big Lutron shop. And of course, Lutron acquired Keptra, what is it, about a year ago now? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was either one or two years ago now. Ooh, I've lost two track. Hours. Two. And um, what what are you seeing as the trend and really the adoption rate of the the residential consumer in your market? Are they are they buying what you're selling? So I believe that the the uh, not necessarily a trend. I think it's here to stay. It's more of the educational process around tunable lighting, uh, just human centric circadian rhythm style lighting systems in a residential space. They've been around a long time in hospitality and commercial environments, uh, keeping people, you know. Uh, in wellness applications uh, at their top game. And I think having it in a home now, because the technology is there, uh, the price points are becoming more affordable. It's not just Lutron, but there's low voltage options like Color Beam. That's what we're most familiar with. Uh, it's really neat to have that as a category for a lot of reasons. Uh, it can really help you know, add to the things you can offer. But at, at the end of the day, even if we're not the ones offering or providing the tunable lighting, we at least want to make sure it's part of the conversation. So if the design team, architect, builder, electrician, um, you know, they're already doing it, that's fantastic. If they didn't know about it, we're here to educate. If they want to be the ones to uh, take it on, that's great. If they don't want to take it on, we can help them with it. So we just want to make sure that we're advocates for the technology because it's not going anywhere. It's going to become more and more uh, put into new, new, new construction homes and we just want to make sure we're there to at least educate. And if they want us to be the partner and the provider, then we can do that as well. When you educate the, and I'll stick to the consumer right now, the homeowner, is it a hard conversation and or how do they receive the the education that different color temperature light can affect their circadian rhythm, their sleeping you know, habits, their energy levels? Are they skeptical or do they go, yeah, that makes sense? It's a mixed uh, reaction. And I think the biggest reason why is because this is a conversation that they're probably assuming to have with their lighting designer or their interior designer or even their architect. When the supposed AV guy, you know, which is a silly term now for anybody in the integration space, uh, is talking to them about tunable lighting and circadian rhythm and wellness, it's, there's a disconnect. So we have to create a way where uh, we partner up with the specifiers who should be specifying this or at least have the knowledge to have the conversation and then be able to support them uh, and not uh, come at the homeowner or whoever, the decision maker from an angle in which they're not thinking that we should be in, like as if we're overstepping our boundaries. And that, that's that been the biggest hurdle. And so I try not to present it directly to the homeowner if I, if I can have the designer or architect or uh, interior lighting person have the conversation, that's great. If they already have it in their, their their ability to do it, that's great. But then they know it's coming and anybody who's at the forefront of their industries and all of those different, um, different trades should at least know what the conversation is when you say tunable lighting or circadian rhythm. It's, a, it's becoming a household term uh, and I think it's just becoming a bigger and bigger thing. 
And the biggest challenge we have, like I said, is to be the person that can have the conversation and not be looked at as the, you know, who is this person trying to sell me fixtures? There's, they should be putting my TV up, you know? All right. Agreed. Next topic, digital art. So, you know, the Samsung, uh, what is it? The frame TV, mm -hmm. uh, I know has caught the attention of my wife. She's saying now she wants a frame TV in her living room. And, uh, I, I appreciate, I think it's pretty cool tech, but the, the concept of digital art is, is a growing category in the luxury home. Can you kind of give, you know, what, what are you seeing there in San Francisco? Well, digital art for us is a great, a great tool because you think about, um, a TV on a wall when it's off, like the one behind your head, it's just this big yep. black rectangle. That's always there. And this is a particularly nice model. I don't oh, know. Yeah, I, it's good. You might, you might want one of these. I like that. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's one of those things where you can really resonate with somebody on the job site. When you talk about art, you might have somebody who's you know, technology adverse. They don't care about anything technology in their mind, but then you say something like art, and then they perk up or you say, you know, we've, we've been hiding TVs behind mirrors and artwork and canvases that roll up and down and whatever for a long time. And those were solutions that were available to us at the time where it's now digital art is now a medium in which people purchase and enjoy art. And just so much as a canvas or a water painting or oil painting, whatever, back in the day, those were the arts. Those were the technologies of art at that time. Well, now we're at a space where where you have a digital canvas, you can display uh you know, images of traditional style art, but you can also display new digital art, which if you have a canvas, you can't do it in reverse, which is really cool because now you've got an advantage of selling digital art because you can do both. And the, the screens now are so good that oftentimes people can't tell what is actually a digital piece of art or an actual canvas on a wall, which is really nice. So, you know, I'm a novice on this subject, okay? So walk walk me through it and or some of our audience through, you know, everyone knows the frame TV at this point, you know, from Samsung. What, what are the other um, components, hardware and software that would enable you as Twilight Solutions to bring a solution to a consumer that would be, that say art's an important topic for them? What, what are you selling them? Well, so hardware varies. You have your um, entry level things like the Samsung, you know, pieces that are framed, um, and then you've got more higher end pieces like a plain art, a art digital wall, and they can be panelized together to create any size. And so, the digital art in the larger sizes is a is a is a, a, a high cost at this time. Like if you wanted to do you know, a, a very large uh, digital art piece on a wall, it's 20 feet by 12 feet, you're looking at, you know, a million bucks or more uh, to make it look real life where you don't see pixelation and all that. A million bucks in the hardware. Correct, yeah. So as it, as it becomes more adapted, you'll see that more. I think that the panels, the 4K and 8K panels that are bigger and they're being mindful of the screen material so there's no glare you can shine a light directly on them and not see any reflective glare so that people wouldn't know it's a canvas or a TV. And so I think that we're at the cusp of that and it's just gonna become more popular. And everybody likes to hide their TVs when they're not in use and also be able to display art in rooms where you otherwise wouldn't have a TV. And this gives you the best of both worlds in that way. So Chris just posted a question. Chris said, uh, uh, can you be a reseller of the art or are you just selling the display? So there are third party software companies. Um, I'm trying to think of the ones that, you know, you what you would want to do is I went to a Barco presentation and they had a, a, a manufacturer there, or not a manufacturer, a software provider that sold you a, a box, almost like an Apple TV that you could display digital art and it's a, it's a subscription, uh, however many pieces you wanna have um, and you can just put up whatever you want. So there you can sell those and they do have um, commissions on art. I don't know exactly what it is. I'm, I'm not a representative of any of those companies, but there are a few. And I would say that next week is the best time if ever to walk around the CDA show inquiring about third party digital art providers that are streaming the content uh, as if you would anything from, you know, Apple or Amazon. You made a comment to me, Justin, when we were recently speaking that 
you were at a Barco event and they put up a chart of where the the you know the the luxury consumer spends their money. Yep. Do you mind maybe for our audience explaining what what you saw in that presentation? Yeah, they had a they had put up a chart showing what the uh, ultra high net uh, individuals in the world spend money on, and it ranged from private jets to uh, super yachts, uh, art, wine, uh, different things of that nature. And the art category was, I believe, the biggest category on the chart, more so than private planes and super yachts. So that's something to think about. You know, we probably oftentimes don't um, really understand that some of these people's the artwork on their walls is sometimes worth more than their home. And so being able to create a, an area where they can display digital art, not so that they can maybe replace their canvas, but so that they have the ability and the medium to display the new digital artists' renderings and work. Because you figure the, the, the more and more technology we become, these younger artists may not be picking up a, a, a brush, right? They may be creating these things out of images on their computer. And so you wouldn't be able to otherwise have that art displayed in your home if you don't have a digital art display. Oh, that's, that makes sense. And uh, Ray Allen just uh, mentioned Black Dove. There you go. As, as a vendor and uh, uh, Rich said the same thing. Black Dove is a company that provides content. So Chris, you wanted a name. There's a name. Research Black Dove. Okay. Um, I got two more. Oh, man, I have so many topics for you, Justin. You you uh, you have so many, such good insight. We have such limited time. <laughs> We're happy to be back anytime you want, Ron. <laughs> awesome. I, I appreciate that. All right. I want to jump to culture and, and particularly for you and your business and you as an individual, I mean, you have, you know, people know Justin, they know Twilight Solutions. <laughs> you carry a certain aura and energy about you. Uh, that's a compliment. It's a good thing. You. <laughs> and you you mentioned that you, you use that to your benefit as it relates to hiring and uh, managing your team and, and ultimately focusing on growing your company. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about the culture within your company and how you, how you manage that and how you use that to, to help you grow and or keep your people? Absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, people, like you said, you, I use it to my advantage, which I suppose that's what's happening. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know any different, right? So I don't know that I'm using it, it's just comes natural. Like being a, a kind person, being invitive and helpful and, you know, employees aren't employees. They're, they're team members. Houston they're just said, uh, people know <laughs> Justin. <laughs> yep. Thanks Houston. Are you flying right now? Put the phone down. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So just creating a situation where it's like, when you're at work, do you want to be with those people when you're not getting paid? And if the answer is no, you're probably doing something wrong. You know, it's not, not that you have to be, you know, friends and want to hang out with you, all your coworkers all the time. But if it's somebody that you're next to and they're in the trenches doing something with you and, you know, as soon as that clock, is, you know, you're off, you're like, this is the last person I want to spend a free minute with if I'm not getting paid to do it. The culture is probably suffering. And I don't think that there's any anything in our team, our company that, you know, when, when the clock is done, that we wouldn't go and grab a beer or have a conversation and just chat, you know, how, how was your weekend? What are you doing this weekend? That kind of thing. Uh, so it's a fine line, obviously with employees and friends, but I think that uh, just being, you know, just a naturally inviting and caring person will go a long way. Oh, that, that makes sense. One, one of the, um, well, you know what, I'm going to finish with that. I'm going to, I'm going to jump into uh, one other quick, tech topic, just because I think it's timely, particularly for you and where you live. And, uh, and then I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the heads up. I want to close it with, you've been at this for 20 years and there are some folks listening and watching that uh, are, are newer, i.e. I less than 20 years in business. And uh, I'd, I'd love for you to give some advice, but uh, before we go there, uh, there's a, a new category uh, for our industry, uh, similar to some of the categories we've talked about, but uh, that I, I think is interesting. So I wanted to get your two cents on it. And that is this growing conversation around power storage. You know, there's a, a concept of energy automation, tying energy storage into your control system, 
but just generally putting batteries in the house and, and this industry pretend, potentially being a significant player in that. How do you see this playing out? And, and is this a topic of interest there in Northern California? It, it 100% is, and it hasn't been up until recently. Um, you know, all the power storage things I've seen in the past, uh, for the most part, were in areas where they experienced uh, in just very tremendous weather issues, whether it be tornadoes, hurricanes, that kind of thing, where the power could go out for days or weeks or whatever at a time. When California, other than an earthquake, you know, we really don't need power storage. Up until the last few years, uh, we've realized with a lot of what's going on in the world, we've got a lot of uh, uh, big, huge fires, right? So we've had fires come through in the last two, three years that have wiped out entire cities, like literally thousands, tens of thousands of homes in one fire. So for us, it's become a reality and it's it's uh, starting to become something that we need to focus on. Uh, PG&E, which is our local provider of electricity, is currently in bankruptcy. They're being sued for billions of dollars and their response to the wildfires is, well, when it's hot, which it gets here in California, and when it's windy, which it can be windy here at times, we're just going to turn the power off. And I, I experienced this for the first time last month. I was going to one of our job sites in a city that you would never think would need the power to go off. And the general contractor said the power's off for 72 hours because it's it's hot and windy this week. And uh, we can't work because we can't. there's no power for anything. Uh, so it's it's becoming a reality very fast and that's something i'll be looking for at cd next week because you think about a grid to just every time it's hot and windy which could be you know several times a month in the summer they're just going to turn your power off because they, they can't serve service all of the power lines that are could potentially create a fire near brush or a tree uh so that's their solution to it because otherwise they could be become more and more liable so they're just going to turn it off <laughs> so we have to have power backups so that's interesting. So in terms of a category, you know, the, the, the number of, you know, vendors that are entering this space or in the space, you know, there's Rosewater, there's Sonin, of course, there's Tesla. We've all heard about Tesla Powerwall. There's uh, Savants getting into the energy game. Um, and then, of course, you have all your UPS companies like Surgex and, and whatnot. Is this a... a an area of investigation for you at Cedia this year is looking at these different players to determine, you know, who to do business with or how are you approaching it? Uh, absolutely. I think for us, uh, of all the names you have mentioned, we have an advantage because Tesla is, you know, an hour from our, our office. And so everybody, I mean, there's more Teslas per person in the Bay area than anywhere in the world. Right. So, uh, most every single one of our homes that we are in have a Tesla power charger in the garage. So just by saying, let's add a battery backup, it might be an easy thing. So I will definitely be exploring that category because it's it's now, as of the last few months, it's a huge thing that people now can easily relate to because before you try and sell them a power thing, they go, well, we don't, the power doesn't go out here. We don't have weather and stuff. Well, now we have fires and the power's going to be turned off when there's a potential risk for a fire, which is basically four months of the year every summer and into the fall. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you take someone's electricity away from them. They, they, they'll be they making calls their attitude quick. real quick. Yeah. All right. So, and by the way, uh, I just have to put this uh, up on the screen. Uh, Joel says, uh, loves the beard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joel. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then Chris, uh, says I'd love to be self-sufficient at home. Solar energy, rainwater, borehole. I don't know what, bore, what does borehole mean. I don't know if we want to know what that one is. Yeah, uh, Chris, <laughs> you might have to give us a little bit of explanation more about what you mean by borehole. Mm -hmm. But uh, that that's fine. And Melinda, uh, Melinda works for you actually, and I think she said an You're amen talking yep. about company culture. Um, all right, so I, I want to close out the interview here. Uh, Justin, with a uh, kind of maybe some two cents or words of advice for uh, that integrator out there that is is maybe been at it for less than 20 years. And maybe, what are a few things that you've learned along the way that maybe you wish you could have told your younger self, uh, your younger entrepreneurial self? 
And uh, if you'd be so kind, uh, anything that comes to mind, it could be any topic that seems right, but uh, as it relates to, to running a business. Absolutely. Uh, there's two things in the technology side and the business side. As a, as a, uh, a younger integrator, if you're just getting started, you know, make sure you've got the, the business coaches and advisors on your side because that stuff is very important. And you'll want to know that and keep up with that. Uh, the technology side, uh, you couldn't be coming at a better time because a lot of what we do now actually uh, works pretty well. And so <laughs> 10, 20 years ago, it was like every single project was a, a science experiment. And that's still of the case. So things actually work now. There's a lot of great companies out there building great products. And the awareness is out there for the end users. The mass market knows what we do. And uh, we're at a time in the economy when uh, everything's hot and all things are coming together. So good for you to become an integrator and uh, just uh, plan your exit strategy well in advance, whether it's 10, 20 years out. Uh, maybe you'll be a part of Bravis. Who knows? Awesome. Awesome. Justin, thank you for, for joining me on uh, episode 87 here of Automation Unplugged. It, uh, how, how was it for you to be live? I, I remember a couple of years ago, you were in an audience when I was teaching the uh, the audience about going live on Facebook. And I think you were like the first person to go live right away. Uh, so yeah, no, it's, how fun. Was it? it's fun. It adds an extra layer of uh, the conversation and just... Uh, keeps things interesting and uh, you know, high energy. It's, it's always better when you got video attached to uh, whatever the topic is for sure. Uh, agreed. And Justin, if folks want to learn more about you or learn more about your business, how do you recommend they get in touch with you? Uh, any ways that they want, uh, you can look me up. Uh, you know, my email is justin at twilightsolutionsinc.com. Uh, my cell phone number is 925-876-5406. Shoot me a text uh, of any kind. I'm happy to check them out. <laughs> awesome. And, and uh, there you go, everyone. Uh, notice the wink, wink. So send them some scary stuff. It, it'll be fun. I can't wait to hear those stories at CDA. Justin, thank you, sir, for, for joining me. And I'll see you next week at the show. All right. Thank you, Ron. Have a good one. All right, buddy. All right, folks, there you have it. That was episode 87. And uh, uh, just uh, back to the couple of pieces of news for you guys. Um, as it relates to the hurricane, uh, we were just talking here at uh, Team One Firefly, and we are going to put out some information regarding a fundraiser that we're going to do to help uh, those in desperate need in the Bahamas uh, that are, are suffering from uh, Hurricane Dor Dorian. In case you haven't watched it on the news, maybe the you know the south the southeast U.S. have been stuck to the Weather Channel, um, you know, for the last week, and maybe in other parts of the country, you guys have been on to bigger, bigger, and better things. But uh, the Bahamas was totally destroyed, uh, the northern Bahamas. So uh, stay tuned for that. We'll post it out to social media. And uh, the other news is that we have uh, we're eminently going to be launching our podcast. So it's uh, Wednesday, September fourth. Uh, one o'clock right now. And uh, we are, our goal is to now get these shows converted out to podcasts. So you'll be able to consume them in audible format uh, here by the end of the month. So uh, I know I'd given you guys some false teasers about this happening earlier in the year. We ran into some uh, uh, scheduling prioritization issues. So now we're, we're making really good progress there. So I'm excited about getting this out there in a podcast format. On that note, uh, I will see many of you hopefully at Cedia. Stop by our booth. Uh, we're in booth 719. Stop by and say hello. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you on the next show. Thanks, everyone.